Wow, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so it, Michelle Freeman, Michelle, where are you? Asked me uh, to speak about curiosity today. And it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's pretty natural and appropriate because Hidden City, that's, that's pretty much what we do. Um, we try to inspire people to be curious about Philadelphia, uh, to help them understand uh, that there are so many things to be curious about. And um, a lot of people know us uh, as, as the place that they go when they have uh, you know, an old building in their neighborhood and they wonder, what the heck's inside there? What's the history of it? Uh, I've always wondered, I've always been curious. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how I ended up doing what I'm doing and the role curiosity played in getting me here. I have to say it's a, it's a little bit surreal to be uh, up here uh, and talking to you and to be, um, to be getting paid uh, to do this work um, because we used to do it for free. And in fact, we used to risk arrest uh, to do it. Um, we'll get to that a, a little bit down the line here. Uh, you know, I don't think you know, any of my friends you know, growing up can, can kind of believe that I've, I've turned it into an actual job. Uh, but I actually don't spend much time anymore uh, exploring Philadelphia. Uh, m most of my job is an office job, right? I answer emails, do fundraising, uh, package stuff up for Hidden City Mercantile, just like anyone else. Uh, on the admin side. Um, but that's what happens when you, when you turn a hobby into a job, right? Uh, you know, you have to do all the boring stuff to make the good stuff happen. Um, so curiosity is, is something that's innate, I think. Everyone has it. The notion that um, children have it uh, naturally is proverbial, childlike curiosity. Um, but what happens to that curiosity as you grow up, that, that depends, right? It depends on your cultural upbringing, your social upbringing. Um, the role of chance is actually a big one. Um, and I don't think I was that much more curious than the next kid. Uh, I like trivia, sports trivia. Um, But looking back, I can see that there were certain things that made me intensely curious about Philadelphia. And fortunately, Philadelphia is the kind of place you can be curious about, right? It's a lot more fascinating than, say, Phoenix, or, sorry, Phoenix, anyone from Phoenix here? <laughs> or Charlotte, uh, just to pick some of my least favorite cities. <laughs> or let's just pick on, like, a little guy. How about Peoria? OK? <laughs> Illinois. Uh, but, but what made me so curious about Philadelphia, probably the most important thing, is that I wasn't born here. I'm not a true born and raised Philadelphian. Probably almost none of you are either. How many actual born and bred, you were born in Philadelphia, you went to elementary school, high school here, how many? So, so n not too many. Um, our family moved to, uh, to West Philly, to 48th and Pine Street um, in 1983. I was 11 years old. And we came from a small town in rural Vermont where we just like literally never locked our doors. And I went from a place like that to living in an apartment building. And on one side of us, we had a, a family of Afghan refugees. And on the other side, we had a family of, well, it wasn't really a family. It was a group of drug dealers. <laughs> and uh, this was a, like a fairly shocking transition for me. And 
Philadelphia at first was this alien and alienating place. Yet, you know, naturally enough, it soon became an object of curiosity for me. Uh, I didn't understand it naturally, right? If you grew up here, you just take it for granted. Uh, but that wasn't the way it was for me or for anyone who comes here from another place. Um, I was, by definition, an outsider. And this outside perspective, uh, this distance, uh, seems to stimulate one's curiosity, I would say, and uh, almost, you might say, lead to heightened powers of observation. Um, when I think about my favorite books about Philadelphia um, and other cities, nearly all of them uh, were written by authors who came from somewhere else. So. Favorite novel about Philadelphia? For me, it's um, God's Pocket by Pete Dexter. Pete Dexter, he grew up in Georgia. He went to college in North Dakota. He was a newspaper reporter in Florida. And he came and worked at the Daily News in the 70s, went on to write that novel. Uh, Patricians and Philistines, uh, just a terrific nonfiction book about uh, Philly history. It was written by a Hungarian refugee, John Lukács, who was a professor for a long time at LaSalle University. A favorite book about New York City, Low Life by Luke Sante. I, I, I see people writing things down. I mean, I really hope you read these books because they're incredible. Uh, one of the earliest and best books about abandoned places uh, was uh, American Ruins by a guy named Camille Vergara. He came here in the 60s from Chile as a college student. He was going to be an engineer, dropped out, started writing about ruins. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say about curiosity, uh, at least in this context, is that it helps to have a sense of detachment, uh, to be an outsider. And, and that allows you to approach a place with fresh eyes. Now, of course, the longer you're here, the less fresh those eyes get. And so that's the challenge, right? Is to, to uh, sort of have what in yoga they call a beginner's mind. Um, so I grew up in West Philly, but I didn't go to school there. I went to Masterman, uh, which is in Spring Garden. And I went to Central High School, uh, which is in Olney. And at Central, I fell in with a group of guys uh, who liked to explore the city. Um, Pretty much, we did it for fun, right? For adventure. There wasn't a whole lot more to it than that. Uh, we figured out how to get on the roof of our school. Uh, we figured out how to get in the, um, there were catwalks that ran over the drop ceiling in the lunchroom. And uh, we figured out how to get into the utility tunnels in the basement. But we never found there was a fabled tunnel to girls high school. <laughs> and we, we, never, we never figured that one out. I have a feeling it was not there. but uh, and, uh, and we hung out in an abandoned building. This was the 80s in Philadelphia. There were still abandoned buildings in Center City. I know, hard to believe. Uh, and the one we hung out on was uh, in was at 22nd and Arch. It's still there. Uh, it's uh, kind of catty corner from the Trader Joe's there on 22nd. Uh, it was turned into lofts about a dozen years ago. At any rate, uh, we just called it The Factory. You know, like capital T, capital F. Completely generic, The Factory. And uh, we drank. And we wrote graffiti in there. That's what we did. And I don't remember ever being the slightest bit curious about why it was built, what they built in there. Of course, now I know through Hidden City, it was the Daily News building, the original one. Um, what we were really interested in back then wasn't history, it was graffiti. Um, it was 
probably more popular then in Philadelphia, I would say, than it is today, uh, believe it or not. And um, th th that's all we saw. It's amazing. You don't realize when you're a teenager just how little of the world you see. We used to uh, go to the Boyd Theater on Chestnut Street. This amazing Art Deco palace. It was torn down, or part of it was torn down very recently. I don't remember there being a single thing interesting about that place. I just, looking at the movie. Um, so, so I'm gonna show you a, a picture, hopefully. All right, that's, that's the factory. Or in fact, that's um, the rail line, the uh, regional rail that comes above ground at 20th Street and then goes up to 30th Street Station. And so the factory is kind of above there, and uh, below there is the, the train wall. That says, anyone guess what that says? <laughs> uh, that one. <laughs> this one. Uh, it's not fair. Uh, it says den, D-E-N. Um, how about this one? This one's a little easier, come on. NM? Here's, an, here's another NM piece. Uh, and, and this actually, this, is, uh, this was done by an artist probably a lot of you recognize uh, today. Uh, Steve Powers, Espo. Did, did that piece right there. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it. Uh, we'll get, there's another one coming up. And he did the love letters, murals, yes? All right, good, good, good. Here's what it liked, looked like all together. It was, it, was, it was pretty incredible. So today, this is just a blank wall, that factory, a bunch of lofts. Uh, a lot cleaner, probably a lot less interesting. Um, And let's, let's take another, all right, here's, a, here's an Espo piece. This was up uh, on one of the rooftops in West Philly that he later did the love letters murals on. And I would take the train from Frankfurt all the way to 69th Street just to look at all the pieces that were up on the rooftops. And there's not really that many left anymore, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view. Um, now, looking back, where were our parents? Uh, you know, what's the opposite of helicopter parents? That's what we had in the 80s. I don't know whether, you know, I mean, we were not overscheduled. Let's put it that way. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know whether that's good or bad looking back. Uh, you know, I never learned how to speak French. I never learned how to play the violin. Um, but in our curiosity uh, th that we had then, it was, it was a little closer to idle curiosity, right? It kind of veered off into boredom and troublemaking, um, I would say. Um, and yet, um, we really got in the habit of exploring the city uh, we were intensely involved with our environment, uh, even if we were doing so in the pursuit of adventure and excitement. So that's the second thing I'd say about curiosity, um, that you need freedom and you need time. Uh, you need unstructured time. And there's actually research apparently out there that shows that that, that unstructured time is connected with creativity. And also that curiosity is a social phenomenon. If it had been up to me, I would have just been in my bedroom watching TV. But I had these friends who were doing these things and I tagged along and had these experiences. So. That's the old Schmitz Brewery on 2nd and Girard. Um, even though I wasn't curious about the factory when I was you know, drinking in there, 
I did become very curious about factories not that long afterwards. Uh, the first uh, job I had uh, after graduating high school was uh, as a horse carriage driver. You know, the folks down on Independence Hall. I only trained for a week. It turned out I really didn't like horses. Uh, or animals, even, really, at that time. I like dogs now. But, um, and the stables were in Northern Liberties. They're now condos, uh, but back then they were between second and third, right near Girard. And so we would take Second Street on our way to Independence Hall and we would pass this, Schmidt's Brewery. Here's another uh, picture of it. Um, this is uh, the part that faces Girard Avenue, or did face Girard Avenue. Uh, and as you went further up second, as you went south on second, this was the next thing you saw, which these are actually still there, and, and those are lofts. And then if you kept going, there's the standard tap, right, today. And then we'd come back on Third Street. And you would see the old Burke Brothers tannery, which was just this terrifying, desolate uh, place. And you'd see the Ortlieb's Brewery, likewise, um, this, this uh, decaying industrial relic. And in fact, to, just to go back, that's where Liberty Lands Park is today. I had a gar community garden plot in there, which I don't know whether they changed the dirt out. I, I, hope, I hope they did. Um, So these were, this was a really powerful environment to, to be a part of, to me as a person, imaginatively. Um, you know, it really felt like this almost post-apocalyptic landscape. If you've ever seen the movie, like, Twelve Monkeys, that's how Philadelphia felt to me in the 80s and early 90s. Um, you have to remember, the Reading Terminal Head House, that was boarded up. Lit Brothers, that was boarded up. The Victory Building on, Chest on uh, 10th and Chestnut, that was boarded up. And, 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 and these decaying places, they just kind of set my mind ablaze. I really love them uh, in a perverse way, right? You're not supposed to love this stuff, are you? Uh, but I did. And then I moved to, Phil uh, I moved to San Francisco for like 10 years. Um, but when I came back to Philly to visit, I'd photograph as much as I could. And there was still like some amazing stuff left uh, in the city then. There still is, but, but anyone know what this is? It's not that long ago. This is um, Delaware Avenue. This is the Jack Frost sugar refinery. It's where the Sugar House Casino is now. <laughs> and you can imagine, I mean, that, that, that's what the riverfront was for decades and decades and decades. And here they are tearing it down. They tried to dynamite it, and it didn't go anywhere. It was built like so solid. They had to <laughs> swing a crane and a hammer. Uh, to get it down. Here's one that, you know, your, your real Philly uh, historic preservationist, this one really kills them. This was the Ridge Avenue Farmer's Market. Uh, it was built in 1875. It was located on uh, 18th and Ridge in Francisville. It was just an absolutely gorgeous building, and it was on the Register of Historic Places, but it deteriorated to the point, and then someone tore it, tore it down. Um, Here's the Gretz Brewery. Uh, it's on 4th and Germantown in Old Kensington. Actually, that part's still there, but the really old part of the brewery did get torn down, uh, unfortunately. Um, so, in general, I think the more you know about something, the more interesting it gets, right? But there's another kind of curiosity or fascination that, that was probably 
more apt description of the way I was then. Uh, and it thrives on not knowing. Uh, like, the less you know, the more you can imagine. And there was one building in particular that I was obsessed with. Uh, you could see it. Um, if you got off I-95 at the Girard exit, uh, you'd, you'd see this building. Uh, my mother would be driving. I'd look out to the right, and there it was, this incredible like a football field's worth of, of windows, this, this humongous bank of them. And I'd always wonder, you know, what was built in there? Why had they stopped? It was just this incredible mystery to me. It was like the pyramids. And I would pass it again and again and again and again. And I'd wonder the same damn thing every time. Here's another view. Uh, this is from the riverside. And I think a lot of people have this experience, right? Like, they write into us wondering about this building or that building. Uh, and, and it made me think, you know, looking back, you know, curiosity is not this like burning desire that overcomes all obstacles. Um, it's more like this like little bud or shoot that needs all the, like the water and light and air that it can get. It needs to be kind of coddled. And um, that's what the internet did for us. Um, it gave us all of these amazing old atlases and maps and industrial directories and photographs so that we could just go and look up the histories of these places. Like, you could do it right now on your phone. And um, it allowed us to publish the Hidden City Daily. It, you know, it, it, it really um, enabled me to move past that same dumb question I kept on asking and find out that this is actually the last remaining building, or was, of the uh, Cramp uh, shipbuilding yard. Uh, it was a turret and lath shop, and it got torn down in 2012 by PennDOT to widen I-95. Um, here's another view of it, and another one. It was really gorgeous on the inside. They had painted the outside red, get rid of the graffiti. And so then the sunlight would come in. It had this incredible ruby glow. There we go. Um, but you know, we had gone into this factory as kids. I, I moved back to Philly at a certain point, and I was going around photographing all these places. And it, at a certain point, like, it never occurred to me to go inside. I was never curi curious enough on my own to go inside. And it was only when one of my friends from back in high school days decided to come with me on Sunday mornings, and we started to actually enter a lot of these buildings. And this, you know, we weren't the only ones doing it, right? There was urban exploring became a thing, um, once again, because of the internet. Um, I think we had seen pictures uh, that people had taken in Detroit. And that kind of inspired us. And, and so we started uh, checking these places out. This is a Willow Steam Plant on 9th and Willow in Callahill. Uh, someone's currently remediating it. I don't know whether they're going to like turn it into the asbestos apartments or what, but um, <laughs> uh, it's an amazing place. It generated steam. It turned coal into steam. This was a Spruance paint factory. Uh, they use those little balls to mix the paint and the drums. Uh, it was in Port Richmond. It's been torn down, but it was kind of an amazing place to see. And this one is uh, the Ninth National Bank in Kensington. It's, it's under the L on Front Street. Uh, there's been a lot of plans in the last 10 years to, to re rehab it, and I think it maybe eventually will survive but it's certainly up in the air right now. It always reminds me of like uh, in 1989 when they had the World Series in San Francisco and there was the, the great earthquake there. They came out with these bumper stickers that said, Nature Bats Last. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I always think of when I see that, that, that photo. Um, so, so we were going into these places and I was 
posting this stuff to Flickr. And, and once again, it was the internet that really took the, the little spark of curiosity and, and turned it into something like a bigger fire. Um, because you're seeing what everyone else is shooting. And you're kind of getting competitive with them. You know, you got into that place, I can get into this place. And it motivated you, and you had an audience. And this was before, you know, Hidden City, before I had any outlet for this stuff. Um, and, and, and so, you know, Flickr made a huge difference. I think the, the notion of like this sort of solitary creative genius is, I mean, I'm sure they exist, but I don't think that's the way it works most of the time. Let's see, what do we got next? Oh, let's wait. So, internet is a great thing, right? Except, it just kind of eats different subjects alive. It just overexposes them. You know, all of a sudden, everyone wants to do it. And you're seeing pictures from all over the world. And you're like, why do I even need to go to any of these places? You know, they've all been gone to. And, you know, it just becomes images. You know, none of it means anything. You're just scrolling on your phone, right? And so it's a, it's, it's a paradox, you know, what the internet does. You know, you're taking away the secrets at the same time as you're giving folks more information to understand them and become more interested in them, right? So I would say to that, that's all true. I mean, I'm saying it right now, but there's also a way in which just being there in real life, you do have these amazing chance, random uh, events that happen to you. Uh, I, was, I was in Fishtown uh, photographing an old factory. This guy, he pulls up in a, in a van. He rolls down his window. He's like, you like taking pictures of old factories? I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding me? He's like, hop in, hop in. I'm like, all right. <laughs> you know? Screw it, you know, it's just, so we, we, you know, we didn't go far, we went a couple blocks away. And, he, you know, he takes me to this factory that they were cleaning out because it was going to get turned into, you know, lofts or apartments. He was, you know, it was him and two other guys, they were the last workers uh, of this uh, place that did metal fabrication. Before that, it had been uh, a hosiery mill, a historic hosiery mill. Today, you know, apartments are beautiful. And like, that was just standing there in the middle of Fishtown seven years ago. Well, eight years ago. It's not there anymore. Or this, uh, this lathe. Incredible stuff. Uh, that's one of the best things about going into old buildings is that people just leave stuff. They don't clean up after the, build, you know, the business kind of goes bankrupt. They just kind of turn out the lights half the time and walk out the door. Uh, and so you see things like this. Let's see. So me and my friend, we got to this point where we'd go in, I would start photographing it. He wasn't interested in photography. He'd get bored. And he'd start looking up the history of the places on his phone. It was like... Uh, it was the exact opposite to me of like going to a museum where you're a passive recipient of all this information. Um, this was the Van Straten and Havy uh, silk mill. It's in Germantown on uh, Berkeley Street. And next door was the Moore Pushpin factory, which isn't as cool of a place, so I didn't show it. It's now like a drug rehab place. It's called uh, Rehab King. I don't know why you'd want to brag about that that way, but <laughs> anyway, my, my friend's on his phone, he's like, more pushpins still in business. It's out in the suburbs. They still make pushpins. It was great. <laughs> it was just wonderful. And so that's how we started doing stuff after that. You know, I'd photograph and he'd look things up. Um, and we're going to kind of wrap things up with um, probably, you know, if you're going to look at uh, 
ask most, most people in Philly what their, their, their favorite old or abandoned building is, it's this one. This is from the Divine Lorraine Hotel. And this was what it looked like in 2005. It went through a bunch of different owners and at some point they cleared out all the stuff from when it had been owned by the Peace, Father Divine's Peace Mission Movement. It had been a hotel. Here's a, here's, yeah, I mean, the, the, decor, the decor was really like, whoosh. At any rate, they sold all the lamps and I didn't buy one. I should have taken one. Uh, but I didn't. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll notice as I'm talking about this, you know, all these things that I'm showing you, pretty much all of them have been torn down or they've been restored. Uh, almost none of them, I think only one of them is kind of in the same shape it was uh, when I was taking these pictures 5, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and so that sort of decaying post-apocalyptic vision of Philadelphia, which I found so powerful, especially when I was younger and, you know, I was alienated and the city felt alienated, it looked alienated in, in a way. Uh, that that, that uh, Philadelphia is disappearing. I mean, yeah, there's still dilapidated parts of Philly, but the overall impression it makes is not that way, I don't think. I mean, people have different opinions on this. They're very subjective, I would say. Um, and the Divine Lorraine is sort of like the poster child for that process. Because everyone fell in love with it when it was this creepy old hotel on Broad Street with the amazing sign and the amazing name. Uh, and I'm so happy it's restored. I mean, there was a time, there was fires in it, you know, no one thought they could make the finances work. It didn't seem like it was gonna, gonna make it. And so I'm so happy it's been fixed up. In fact, like, when we released our book, we had our launch party at the Divine Lorraine. Although we did find, like, the, the, un, the part they hadn't finished. That's where we, that's where we went. Uh, they put us there. It was a long story. Um, but, you know, once a building has been restored and, and has been turned into um, upscale apartments, why would you be curious about that? You know everything uh, that's in there, right? Like, you don't have to go in to know. Uh, you know, it's going to have granite countertops, <laughs> stainless steel appliances. Uh, all the ghosts of the past, you know, they've been sent packing. Um, and so, you know, that's where I am now, you know, uh, as a person with this stuff. I'm really happy that so many of these buildings have been restored. And I may be a little less curious about them as a result. But I think counterbalancing that, I'm much more interested in their histories. And the history never goes away. And it's always there for you. Thank you. <laughs>